Hey, Juan Detroit, I'm Christy McDonald, and here's what's coming up this week on the show. It's a small town perspective in a COVID-19 world. Head into Clawson as we take a look at how business has changed in the downtown since coronavirus. Plus, Stephen Henderson and Nolan Finley on being civil at a time in politics where civility is hard to find. And then the suburbs grappling with racist policies of the past. It's all coming up right now on One Detroit. Support for this program provided by W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation. Ally. And viewers like you. Hi there, and welcome to One Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald. Good to have you with me. Kids are back at school this week, some virtual, some in seat. The weather has taken a turn, and we find ourselves barreling toward the November election. Coming up on this episode of One Detroit, we'll check in with Nolan Finley of the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson of American Black Journal. They take on the lack of civility in politics today, and if that can ever change. Then more suburbs are facing their racist policies of the past in the wake of protests against white supremacy and police brutality. And then saying goodbye to those we've lost on Belle Isle. But we're starting off with our continuing series of a small town during COVID-19. So let's head to Clawson in Oakland County with One Detroit senior producer Bill Kubota and One Detroit editor Chris Jordan. They take a look at how Clawson's restaurants are holding their own as we head into the fall. More home delivery, outdoor seating, take home cocktails, and the grand opening of a cornerstone spot. You could call it innovation or just survival. Hey, thank you. Restaurant owner Charlie Sampson out for a food run. Business as usual during a pandemic. And then it made us really innovators in the sense of like, you know, restaurant, we can't sell food here, so how can we sell the most food out of our carryout to go? We, we jumped on delivery, all the other stuff that we could do, so. All this just had to be after the shutdown this spring. I think our businesses have been so adaptable. Every, every punch that's come along, They've rolled with it, figured out, but that's what entrepreneurs do, and that's what small business owners do. You know, they figure out how they're going to get through the next, the next hurdle. Samson's a Clawson native running what was the Montage Grill, renaming it Whiskey Taco Foxtrot. When did you buy the place? So we took it over March 7th, which was uh, impeccable timing for uh, starting a new business and rolling into uh, a pandemic of sorts. Charlie told us that, much yeah. to his surprise, the business has been really good since the shutdown ended. Same with the others we've been talking to. Part of it is the outdoor seating. They're putting in as much as they can to offset the 50% seating capacity limitation. What do you think about dining al fresco, Chris? I really like it. It feels like a much safer alternative to eating inside right now, and it gives these restaurants a chance to bring people back. Whether it's new places like Whiskey Taco Foxtrot that are trying sort of a new spin on their cuisine. I tried the blackened tilapia taco and it was great. Uh, or whether it's old school classics like Tavern on the Main that's been a mainstay of downtown Clawson forever serving just a really great classic burger. What's it been like during these last few months dealing with the pandemic? Um, it, it was a little difficult. We were open for carryout curbside service, but you know what? They are so loyal to us. They wanted to keep us in business, and yes, we would get a lot of the repeating guests, repeating customers come in here, you know, once, twice, maybe even three times a week to order carry out and curbside service just to keep us going. Then there's White Wolf on 14 Mile, the Japanese-French-style patisserie opened in January, 
With the shutdown, Doran Brooks wasn't just selling pastries curbside. He offered baking flour and chickens, hard to get items at the time, working to the crisis the best he could. What we did here at White Wolf was say, okay, now that we're slowed way down, it gives us a chance to look at what was working, what wasn't working, what the guests really liked, what they didn't like, and we could make all those adjustments during that period. White Wolf's connected to Noble Fish, the Japanese food store and sushi bar. But Brooks was looking at another market, high-end cocktails. Have them here or to go. People can come in and get their drinks, and as long as they don't open the, the beverage until they get home, they can take it to go. Back on Main Street, there's Kave, specializing in Turkish coffee. Been here for six years. With the pandemic, owner Anna Biro reduced staff and shortened hours of operation, but working more hours herself. So far, it's been very good as long as we keep it this way. And I'm th in my mind, we're going through the worst of the pandemic. If it doesn't get worse, we should, ma we should make it okay. Brenna Hauk, editor for Eater Detroit, estimates restaurants running at maybe 30 to 60 percent across the region because of the pandemic, but there's a glimmer of a bright side to this in places like Clawson. One of the interesting and maybe nice things about dining right now during COVID is that it has become much more of a neighborhood-focused dining experience. People are more comfortable staying closer to home than they once were. Staying and working from home, it stands to reason. If you're not working downtown, you're not eating so much down there either. What do you call it? The street party or? The uh, open air street fair. Open air street fair. Mid-August, something to shake off the COVID malaise, organized by Clawson's Downtown Development Authority. Mary Liz Curtin owns the Leon and Lulu store and Three Cats restaurant. And it is the first time I've ever hired a performer and said, don't draw a crowd. If you get too many people around you, shoo them away, run on your long, long legs, but make them all happy from a distance. So we looked at what could we do and with the COVID restrictions, how do we keep people moving? And so this is one time where our spread out downtown worked for us. It's a chance just to go out and smile and have a good time. I don't know if we can do our big Halloween event this year, but we can do this little funny one. It's very small, very low key, in a tall, tall way. The street fair provided a look inside Clawson's newest restaurant, Puma Chug, at the prime corner of 14 in May. By late August, owners Andrea and Tyler Williams held a soft open. Back in the 1800s, the corner that we're on now was a sawmill. Down the street across the other corner, there was a cider mill as well. As people were coming through the town to go to work in Detroit, the noise of the mills made a, quote, pumachug, pumachug, pumachug sound. So this area was nicknamed Pumachug and the Corners. The Williamses are new to the restaurant business, but they did market research a citywide survey of what residents want. It sounds silly to talk about, but when we first like came up with this idea, it was a Friday night where we switched from, I, I hope somebody does something cool at this corner, to let's do it. Yeah. We, we came up with this probably stupid idea. We watched all of the Restaurant Impossibles, and, and we bar, just like binge-watched all of those, trying to scare ourselves away from making kind of a stupid decision. Who wants yeah. to open a restaurant, right? But it didn't work. No, we, we, it didn't we, work. we made it through the weekend and, and all the horror stories you see there. And we're like, I, we think we can do this. <laughs> that was nine months ago. This past week, you couldn't get in without a reservation. Opening a restaurant's like having a baby. When it's time to open it, you open it. It doesn't matter if there's a pandemic. It doesn't matter if there's a recession. Once you put all that time in, it's got to come out. So we wish them the best. It's, it's delightful inside and they're they're so smart and they're charming we think it's going to be good puma chug's biggest challenge now finding more cooks they have to close on mondays to give their chef a break i think you can probably look at almost every restaurant now and find that they're all asking for help some of the shortage might be people sitting this out collecting unemployment then there's still the fear of catching the virus it really is a cost benefit problem the reality is, is that restaurant workers who are going back now, um, they're just not making the same money that they were before. They're serving fewer customers because of the lowered capacity. If they're a tipped employee, they're not making 
as many as much in tips as they used to. Talking to Eater Detroit's Brenna Howe, she sees even more lost with the pandemic. Wearing those masks removes a lot of the personal connections servers have with their guests. So she says people tend to tip less. Yeah, we'll have to see if that's the case here in Clawson, but these restaurants have an even more pressing concern right now with the weather. Pumachog really expanded their patio space to get as much outdoor dining as possible, but with fall rapidly approaching, who knows how long that'll last. Right, and can you really enjoy your veggie burger and truffle fries out there if the gales of November come early? And there's a whole lot of other restaurants in that same boat. Uh, we have one of the largest patios in the area, so that's what's saving us right now because we have to go 50%. Right, right. And, and uh, I don't know what's going to happen come winter. I mean, I'm gonna, we'll get heaters and try to keep it as warm as possible and push it through November. Mm -hmm. But not enclosed because when we talked about enclosing the patio the clientele and the customers were like no 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 don't do that we like the, the, the fresh air and uh -huh. stuff we get to a spot where it's you know we got to take that risk we have to try to normalize a little bit of what the situation is and we have to move forward the smell of this yeah Okay. So okay. Even with the oh. mask on. And I think there's going to be those people that want to do it and those people that are hungry enough to do it. And I, you know, I encourage them to come out and know that there's a good network of restaurant owners and chefs down here that are like, hey, we're here to see you succeed because the more success you have, the more success we'll have. This is such a cliche, but I do believe we will be stronger than we were before because people are learning to appreciate now what we have. People are learning to appreciate the family-owned businesses too. And because they know we struggle just as much as they do. <laughs> to catch part one in our series of a closer look at Clawson during the coronavirus, just make sure you head to our website, OneDetroitPBS.org. You can check it out there. All right, post-Labor Day and a big election year always means campaigns ramp up. But in a COVID world, campaigning is pretty different. Civility and messaging seem to be at an all-time low. But our One Detroit contributors, Nolan Finley of the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson of American Black Journal, have spent a lot of time studying and talking about civility in our world, especially coming from two different political philosophies in an intensely polarized time. So, Nolan, I think we have about seven and a half weeks left before the presidential election. It's going, to seem, it's going to seem like a whole year uh, with all of the things that are going to happen and with all the fighting uh, that's going to take place. I, I will say this. I don't think things are as bad yet as they might have seemed like they would have been for this election year. I think just the opposite, Steve. I, th I think they're already, <laughs> they're already off to, at all levels, campaigns at all levels, not just the presidential race, but the Senate races as well, congressional races. It's attack, attack, attack. What I worry about is forcing these campaigns to go electronic and a lot more heavily online, on social media than they once were, allows them to reach more targeted audience who share their views. And I think that just contributes, contributes to more negativity and less positive dialogue. My bigger worry, I think, is the day after election day mm -hmm. and the month after election day and January 20th of 2021, regardless of what the outcome is, right? Uh, yeah. If Donald Trump is reelected, if Joe Biden is is made the president, I, I feel like, uh, you know, the differences that exist between us have been uh, really profound for a long time. They've been highlighted by the pandemic. No matter who's elected, uh, that doesn't abate at all in 2021. Uh, I feel like it's going to intensify. And I just wonder how much more it, you know, how much worse it can get before we, you know, reach some sort of truly uh, unhealable point. One of the maybe bright spots has been this work that we've been trying to do is, uh, with, with a lot of different groups. And we should thank uh, Delta Dental for right. their support for the Civility Project this year. It's made us be, be able to do all of this. Uh, and we've just been bringing people together in small groups, uh, small and medium-sized groups, to talk about how to talk to each other and to, to think about ways to get past uh, these divisions, these political uh, issues that, that people just can't agree on. 
get to know each other a little better, especially in your own neighborhood, in your own community, uh, and, and really try to understand more about where uh, the other side is coming from. Uh, it's harder now than it used to be, but I think we've seen a fair amount of success with the groups that, uh, that we've interacted with. I think people recognize we're not in a healthy spot and they're looking for, for ways to, you know, something to do about it. What I worry about, Steve, is, is that the response in too many quarters is less talk, not more. I don't think that gets us to a point of civility. I think that, cause, that pushes issues underground where they fester only to erupt later on. I think we need to talk things out. We need to work things out. The idea behind civility, as we're defining it, is, is not niceness. It's not politeness. It's, <laughs> it's managed conflict. It's, it's the idea that there are differences. There are profound differences between people and the way that they think of things. And that the way to, to uh, be able to have all of that coexist is to be able to argue about those things, right. be able to be passionate about it, even angry, without it devolving into the, the sort of uh, really violent or bitter conflict that we've seen in, in lots of quarters. Um, I mean, it is easier, I think, just to disengage and say, well, I'm not going to deal with anybody uh, who thinks differently from me. Um, right. It's harder to say, I'm going to stand in and have this conversation and maybe get upset and maybe get that other person upset, but I'm not gonna let it ruin what should be uh, a relationship between um, me and this person who I don't necessarily agree with. I mean, we, we can reach a point of reconciliation without coming to agreement. We can reach a point where we value another person's opinions, even if we don't agree with them, that we see the benefit of exchanging ideas, uh, as you said, you can be passionately, but with the notion that we're going to make it through this conversation, an honest conversation, even a passionate one, and come out on the other side still respecting and loving one another. And, you know, I think that's what we've been able to do. I mean, I'd hate not to be able to scrap with you, Steve, and I know it makes people uncomfortable sometimes. <laughs> it, would be, it would be a less interesting world, for sure. Right. <laughs> the watchwords from here to November 3rd should be don't lose your minds. Yeah, right. That's right. Keep it together. All right, our thanks to Nolan and Stephen. We'll see you guys next week. This summer, protests against police brutality and white supremacy have mostly taken place in the city of Detroit. But the suburbs are now beginning to grapple with their own racist history and policies. Historically, sundown towns have been defined as places where African Americans weren't permitted to live. One Detroit associate producer, Will Glover, talked with Bridge Detroit's Bryce Huffman about his recent report on how many Detroit suburbs are wrestling with their legacy of being sundown towns that carried out anti-black policies. What is a sundown town and, you know, why did you decide to uh, write this article? Sundown towns are towns where either um, on paper, um, in a law or in housing contracts, black people basically weren't allowed to live there. Uh, they're called sundown towns because oftentimes black people were allowed to work there, um, usually in butler or nanny capacities, um, but they weren't allowed to own homes there. So if they were there after sundown, um, they would either be escorted out by law enforcement, uh, escorted out by the threat of violence by an angry mob, or actually faced real violence. Uh, and I wanted to write about this because a lot of the time when we talk about racism and our, our country's history with it, we don't talk about how racism looked in the North. What, what is the difference between what we're talking about when it comes to sundown towns versus segregation or, as you referenced, um, the racism that uh, people were facing down South? So I think the big difference is the legality, right? So uh, sundown towns didn't all have the same laws and same practices, but what, um, what kind of gives them the term sundown town is that somewhere they were uh, explicitly being anti-black, whether it was in housing policies, for instance, uh, a lot of the gross points and a lot of Detroit suburbs had it in housing contracts that you weren't allowed to sell this home to a black family, even you know when 
black families could afford to buy the house. Um, or other times there were laws literally saying black people aren't allowed to be here after dark. How are some of the remnants of this, these sundown towns and that segregation still you know, with us today? Racial profiling in police. Um, and it's something that uh, people really push back on this idea, but it's, it's actually quite simple. If you live in a suburb that is 90 plus percent white, and you see a group of black kids driving through it, the police automatically look at them as outsiders. And I think that actually is where a lot of the implicit bias against young black men particularly comes from when it comes to law enforcement. It's, huh, you're in an area that historically you have never been in. What are you doing here? It automatically brings up suspicion. And instead of you know seeing me as someone who's going home after visiting a friend, I'm now someone who's seen as a suspect in some wrongdoing. One of the things you touch on that is kind of an example of that is the recent uh, billboard outside of Livonia, which said, uh, driving while black, racial profiling just ahead. Welcome to Livonia. So when you talk to law enforcement, what was their reaction to, you know, the notion of sundown towns and uh, that billboard? The Livonia <laughs> police did not like the billboard. Um, and I, I don't think any police officer would. It is, it's putting them in a box of, you don't like black people, you're suspicious of black drivers. And what I think the, the billboard really is trying to do is have us start a conversation about those things, about that very real history and that very real practice of seeing black drivers as suspicious. So uh, the Livonia police chief actually pushed back against it and says, you know, we never teach that. We don't encourage racial profiling. That's not something that we're trying to do. Yet, when you have a whole community of people who feel like, well, that's something that's happened to me. That's something that I've experienced. You can't just negate that experience. How are these suburbs changing their respective histories? Some cities like Ferndale have really changed their reputation. Ferndale, um, to many people's surprise when I published the piece, was a sundown town. Um, but now Ferndale is seen as this very progressive, liberal place where everyone is accepted in large part because their acceptance of the LGBTQ community. And I don't know about you, but when I see a pride flag, I feel a lot safer because I'm like, if they, if they like gay people, there's a chance they don't hate black people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. just, true, just a little but bit, just a but yeah. you know, it makes me feel just a little bit more comfortable, you know? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of these suburbs uh, have really changed their reputation just with the influx of new people coming in. And that is going to do it for us. Thanks so much for joining me. Make sure you check us out at OneDetroitPBS.org for the stories that we're working on and all of our daily interviews. All right, I'd like to leave you tonight with a look at the people we have lost this year from COVID-19. At the end of August, the city of Detroit had a day of remembrance. They put the pictures of each person who died from coronavirus in Detroit around Belle Isle so people could share their grief together and remember. It's worth taking a moment and holding a thought for those we lost. I'll see you next week. Take care. You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter.